everybody, and welcome back to Security in the 21st Century. I'm your host, Dr. Suzanne Loftus. I'm really excited to have with me on the show today, Dr. Michael McFall. Michael McFall is an academic and diplomat who served as US ambassador to Russia between 2012 and 2014, and worked for the US National Security Council as special assistant to the president and senior director of Russian and Eurasian affairs. He was the architect of US President Barack Obama's Russian reset policy and is now currently a professor of international studies at Stanford University. Ambassador, Dr. Professor McFall, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Thanks for having me. You've obviously published a lot and lately I've uh, read your article on international security in the fall of 2020 on Putin, Putinism and the domestic determinants of Russian foreign policy, as well as your piece for the Washington Quarterly, uh, Cold War Lessons and Fallacies for US-China Relations Today. And I thought both of those pieces of literature were extremely relevant for the geostrategic competition that we're witnessing today between Russia, China and the United States. So perhaps we could start off with your take on why since the fall of the Soviet Union, when we saw that Russian American relations were rather cooperative, why has that suddenly or not so suddenly shifted to a more confrontational relationship today? What would be your thoughts on that? My basic thought is that um, regime type matters and leaders matter. And international relations is not just about the balance of power between you know, Russia and China, or Russia and the United States, China and the United States. And in both of the pieces you just mentioned, I make those kind of arguments in different ways. Uh, with respect to Russia, uh, you know, the end of the Soviet Union and the early years of the independent Russia uh, had leaders in place, Gorbachev and then Yeltsin, uh, who aspired to join the West. They wanted to be part of the international community. They wanted strategic partnerships with the United States and, and other democracies in Europe. Um, and they were trying to build, I would say unsuccessfully, more democratic political systems. Um, and the confluence of those two forces, I think, was the reason why we had close relations uh, with, with first, and I, I want to emphasize it started with Gorbachev and, you know, I think Ronald Reagan. I think Ronald Reagan played a very instrumental personal role uh, in bringing our uh, two countries closer together. Had there been a different American president, that history might have also been different. Um, but I also think there was an effort, a part of the West, to say we want to help uh, Russia succeed in this transition. Uh, towards the markets and towards democracies. And you could imagine a different leadership if they thought Russia was the enemy, that they would not have provided economic or political assistance. Um, in the end, uh, Russian democracy did not take root. Um, in, in one of my books on this, several books probably by now, but most certainly I've written about this before, I don't think the West did enough to help consolidate markets and democracy in Russia. We, we thought you know, the whole world was gonna become democratic and we didn't need to do much. I think that was a critical strategic mistake in the West. And as a result of that, in the Putin era, uh, he has gradually consolidated an autocracy. Uh, and over the last couple of decades, that has led to more and more tensions between Russia, the United States and the West principally because Putin sees democracy and American efforts to support democracy in the world as a threat uh, to Russian security is the way that he defines it. There are many other factors we could go through the whole history, but I, I think you know the, the, my focus, which is very different than many other scholars, is to say that domestic politics matter. It's not just about how many airplanes Russia has, how many cyber weapons they have, because a different leader in a different regime might use those same instruments of power in a different way. Exactly. Yes. And you've highlighted that in your in your article. You mentioned that Vladimir Putin, you know, has agency as every other leader of the world does. And it's due to the specific nature uh, and belief system and uh, uh, basically leader that uh, certain choices are made both in foreign and domestic policies. So a little bit more on that. Um, 
we've heard or we've seen in various opinion polls throughout the last several years that many of the actions that Vladimir Putin took, such as the annexation of Crimea or its involvement in Eastern Ukraine or its involvement in Syria, or even just in a, in a rhetorical sense, the, his narrative about how US foreign policy is rather aggressive or how um, Americans you know, seek to achieve world domination, for example, all of that seems to be well received within Russia. And could it be that this so-called Putinism that we speak about is actually a combination of what Putin says and decides, but also just the reciprocity from the population and the support of the population in return that makes it so vibrant and long lasting? Is it, is it legitimate inside Russia? Yeah, I mean, you've just asked a very, you know, the fundamental question, very complex, hard to answer uh, question about the relationship between domestic politics and foreign policy. Um, without question, if we go back to, you know, 1999, when Putin became prime minister, and then in 2000, when Yeltsin chose him to be president, and notice I'm using those, that, that sentence structure very deliberately. Uh, he was chosen by Yeltsin uh, the people then ratified it. Um, and back then there was no demand for Putinism and nationalism and all that, that Putin himself didn't even know what he thought about the world. Uh, you know, back then he was a economic liberal and he talked about joining NATO, uh, you know, back in February of 2000. It's only later that he develops uh, a more uh, coherent, I would say, anti-American, anti-Western, anti-liberal uh, ideology. Um, but uh, he, he became president of Russia uh, after a decade of economic depression that coincided with the, you know, the emergence of democracy. So it's, you don't need to be a, have a PhD in Russian studies to understand that when democracy is introduced and you enter an economic recession three times worse than what we had in the 1930s, that the word democracy and the practice of democracy is going to, going to become unpopular. Um, and by the way, that happened in all post-communist countries. They all went through that lag, uh, that economic depression. That's not unique to Russia, but his timing was fantastic. So he became president right at the moment when the Russian economy started to grow and, and over time then made the argument that law and order and, and less democracy, less chaotic stuff was was why Russia was growing. Now, correlation is not causation, right? I don't think uh, autocracy in the 2000s is the cause of Russian economic growth. I actually think it was oil and gas prices. And, at, and in fact, uh, liberal economic reforms done in the 90s that eventually had their results uh, in the 2000s. But if you're a political leader, you take credit for whatever happens on your watch. And so most certainly Putin is popular because of that history. Uh, secondly, uh, you're right to point out that when he did annex Crimea, uh, that was very popular in Russia. Uh, his pop, you know, his opinion poll ratings uh, skyrocketed. Um, and, but with a couple of caveats, we need to remember, um, you know, Russia is not a free society. Uh, all the television stations, the main television stations, are controlled by Putin. Uh, there's no uh, effective uh, challengers to him in, in, you know, either houses of parliament. Uh, most oligarchs, most big business people uh, are loyal to him today. So when you say, well, everybody supported him, well, what's the causal arrow there, right? I mean, he's propagating that this is a coup by the Americans, uh, the Nazis and the NATO, um, and there's no alternative narrative out there. And you know, it's on my mind because here in the United States, you know, 30% of Americans uh, we're learning in opinion polls don't think that we had a free and fair election in November. And that's because the president of the United States is out there propagating misinformation and he has support for it. So we shouldn't be surprised that in a country where you control all media, that that, that narrative would be popular. But then the next thing, ne next uh, moment of complexity, um, I think even, and remember opinion polls in Russia, most of the companies are controlled by the state. Uh, it's dangerous to express your opinion. 
you know, if you're sitting out there in Vladivostok and, you know, some stranger calls you from Moscow and says, you know, what do you think of Vladimir Putin? It's pretty rational to say, I support Vladimir Putin. There's no upside for revealing your actual preference. Um, but, but even with all those caveats uh, included, um, it, the popularity of those aggressive belligerent actions have fallen off. Um, so the peak that he got after uh, uh, annexing Crimea, that's fallen off. And, you know, I think that suggests that the idea that to do that again will not be popular. Um, and, and, and I would say, like in any society, um, if it were more open and there was actual public debate, uh, yes, there would be nationalists that would support those actions in Russia. Uh, there are many people in Russia that do. When I was ambassador, I met them all the time. Uh, they are people with strong convictions. Uh, there are many other Russians that think these were giant mistakes. Uh, most of those people are quiet. Uh, they're, not, they're not tweeting about it because they, they understand the cost of that. And then there's a large swath of Russians that are kind of you know in the middle and not really thinking about these kinds of issues. They're more worried about bread and butter issues that in a more democratic society might say, hey, was it really worth it uh, to do these actions against the United States in 2016 in our elections or the, the war in Syria or even annexation when there were economic costs that came about that? Uh, right now, you don't have a political party or opposition then that can articulate that in a free and fair election. But if you had different uh, institutional uh, uh, setup and more independent media, there I think there would be a bigger, more healthy debate about that. So you know, my, you can see it's a it's a complex question. Uh, do countries do people want to be great powers versus not? Yes, that's easy, of course. But but is it a great power to annex the territory of thy neighbor? That I think is more debatable. I don't I don't I personally don't think that's in Russia's national interests. And I think there's a there's a very strong argument to be made that that this tendency towards autocracy, and 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 kind of uh, disaggregating and distancing from Europe has made Russia worse off, not better off, over the long run. Yes, I mean, and their case is a particular, uh, and so are uh, all the post-Soviet states. Is that you know once the uh, once the Soviet Union fell, they each had to remake themselves and rediscover who they are and Russia went through that process are we more European are we more Asian are we Eurasian are we democratic are we autocratic and when Putin came I think he really seized on that opportunity and and created this post-Soviet national Russian identity that was highly accepted and people were very proud uh, for a while because you know they're used to being a great power in the past and you know, he brought that back. And so there's a lot of factors at play, but as you mentioned, um, you know, with time, many may start to wonder if these decisions are really right for the country or if they're not better off in some, some other way. Well, I, I would just add to that, that, that I don't know the answer to that in the long term, mm -hmm. And I don't trust anybody who claims that they know the answer, uh, which is to say that this is a long post-revolutionary moment that we're in uh, in Russia today, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, there was, you know, in my view, a revolutionary movement against the Soviet Union uh, that succeeded for a while, toppled one of the last great empires in the world. Uh, every time that happens, whether there's a revolution or the collapse of an empire, there is, uh, you know, it's uh, a pushback to it. Uh, thermidor is the word that the French used. Um, and that's, that happens every single time. There's nothing surprising about this at all, as far as I'm concerned. What I don't know is the long term. Is, is Putin the last hurrah of the Ancien Regime, to, to invoke the French Revolution again, right? Uh, is this the last hurrah? He's, you know, he's, he's a Soviet guy, as you pointed out. He, he, most of his life experience was in the Soviet Union. He, he, he's, his formative years were in the KGB. That's all part of the old Soviet regime. Um, uh, will that continue in the post-Putin era? Or is this kind of the last hurrah and then you'll see a pendulum swing back? I don't know the answer, I wanna be clear. 
but I'm very skeptical of people that think, uh, well, it's all uh, preordained and Russia's this way and it always has been. I see a lot more volatility in Russia and, and Soviet history, especially in the last 30 years. Well, that's a perfect point to make because I was just about to ask you about that. Uh, you know how the, the Russian Federation is run by this so-called Siloviki, so Putin's uh, inner crew. And uh, so there's this large network of, um, you know, friends and people who, who know each other, who give each other, uh, who appoint each other and who work for the big companies and for all the important positions. And they all tend to have similar values and, and um, ways of viewing Russia and what Russia should be and what the West is. So even in a post-Putin era, would that you know, network of Siloviki perpetuate? Would it not still exist? And would these policies not still be the, the common way of the, of the day in Russia? You know, Suzanne, an excellent question and I don't have an excellent answer. Um, and, and I wanna keep saying that, that, you know, political scientists aren't very good at predicting the future. Uh, I worked five years in the government. I would say our intelligence community is not very good at it either. So with those caveats, uh, uh, let me say a couple of things, because I, I think this is kind of the fundamental question about Russia's future. Uh, number one, I know most of those people you just mentioned. I've known them, some of them I've known for 30 years. I, I met Igor Sechin in the spring of 1991, uh, who's very close to Putin and now runs Rosneft. And you're absolutely right. Uh, there is this network. Uh, they were people that didn't do that well economically in the 1990s. And so when their guy came to power, uh, they used that access to redistribute property rights. Uh, and in, in the case of Ross Naft, to literally take them away from somebody who benefited in the 90s, Mr. Hrdokovsky, and, and reallocate them to Ross Naft. I mean, that's exactly what happened. The, the problem for the future for people like Mr. Sechin and Ross Naft and that alliance that you, you described is that that redistribution of property rights was not codified in the rule of law. It was codified through your personal connections to Putin. So when Putin is no longer in power, suddenly your property rights are gonna be threatened. Uh, not unlike the property rights of the oligarchs were after Yeltsin uh, stepped aside, right? Remember in the 1990s, all of those oligarchs uh, seized their, many of them, not all of them, there's, there's more variation, but many of them uh, had assets because of their direct personal relationship with Yeltsin and his entourage, right? His, his uh, circle in the Kremlin. And the year he stepped down, several of them lost those assets. And the first, you know, there was a redistribution. Um, and I don't see anything that would prevent that from happening again in a post-Putin era. So that, that's the first thing. I think there'll be a struggle over those things. Uh, number two, um, if you compare autocratic regimes, different kinds, right? Military juntas, uh, one party rule and charismatic leaders, the most uh, unstable kind, not surprisingly, are these, uh, these charismatic leaders. Because once they leave, there's not an institutional basis for uh, their, their, their organizational structure for governing to, to carry on. Um, and Putin falls in that category of a, and he is a charismatic, su successful leader. I, I definitely think he is. Uh, but it's not obvious who uh, inherits that. And the party system there is pretty weak. Uh, his, his attempts to kind of build these crony circles to govern more widely, I think have been, you know, not that successful. Um, and even with his, in his own government, I would argue that there are lots of people that disagree with this, this setup. Uh, I used to meet them all the time when I was working as ambassador. Again, they're not, they're not on Twitter. They're not talking to you. Uh, they're not, you know, they're not talking uh, loudly about how they don't like the current situation. That would be dangerous. Uh, but to assume that they're just gonna go along uh, after Putin, uh, I actually, I think there'll be quite a big fight for the future of Russia uh, at the end of the Putin era. Well, those are some very important points to consider when trying to predict uh, the future for the Russian Federation. It's true, it's not, uh, it's not easy to do so. And many may fall into the, 
the structural trap or the cultural trap, uh, but there, there's definitely room for change all the time. Uh, we never know. I mean, we didn't even predict the fall of the Soviet Union. So what can we predict now? So, so thank you for sharing that. Um, you mentioned in uh, one of your articles that a way that the US and Russia could potentially have closer relations is if the regime was different. So let's say a more liberal regime in Russia or a more illiberal regime in the United States, for example. And we've seen in the last several years uh, with Donald Trump as the uh, US president, that he was not so much uh, the biggest proponent of uh, American liberal democracy and uh, the transatlantic values. And you know, these were the main criticisms of his, uh, of his actions. And um, so one could argue that that was perhaps a more illiberal type of president in the United States. But what happened between Russia and the US, they didn't exactly become friends in the last few years, if I may ask you that. You're right, you're absolutely right. So uh, without question, uh, President Trump uh, did care less about democracy and human rights abroad, didn't care at all with respect to Russia. Uh, I would say the opposite. He was uh, made excuses for Vladimir Putin all the time and played his own game of what aboutism when challenged about it. He would say, well, you know, we kill people too, uh, as he said four years ago. But, um, uh, and I would, you know, I would walk around the world and say it's uh, there, he, he embraced other illiberal leaders, uh, you know, some of his closest. Uh, uh, relationships were with non-democratic leaders or those moving away from democracy like Viktor Orban in Hungary. And some of his most challenging relationships were with people like uh, Chancellor Merkel. Um, and at the same time, as you rightly pointed out, it is striking to me how little the Trump, President Trump himself achieved in any tangible outcomes that I think vis-a-vis uh, -vis Russia that were good for the American people. Uh, you know, when I was in the government, we all, I learned this, this word deliverable. Uh, it's, a, it's a word that the State Department used. What's the deliverable from the meeting or the summit uh, or your, your foreign policy strategy? Um, and, uh, you know, in the early days of, of Obama and Medvedev, um, you know, there's lots of mythologies about what the reset was, was what is about and what it wasn't about. In my view, it was about deliverables. It was about trying to achieve concrete things that made the American people more secure. So the New START Treaty, you know, we signed a treaty in Prague with President Medvedev, reducing by 30% the number of nuclear weapons in the world. Leave aside good relations, bad relations, holding hands and singing Kumbaya or all that other stuff. That's what we wanted to do. That's what we got done. And then we got the Senate to ratify it. Uh, that's good for America. Uh, and, and I could go through a whole host of other ones, you know, uh, supplying our troops in Afghanistan through Russia, uh, sanctions on Iran, the most uh, comprehensive multilateral sanctions ever uh, against Iran. We got that because of uh, working with Russia. But, but and I, I won't go through that history now, but if you look at the Trump era, I can't think of a single outcome, a concrete outcome where we can say, well, that Trump and Putin sat down, they signed an agreement, and as a result of that, the American people are better off. And so that, I think, is a, a bit of a paradox, that despite all of his happy talk and friendliness towards Putin, um, very, even small deliberal, deliverables, right? Like, like he couldn't get, he hasn't gotten Paul Whelan out of jail, for instance, right? He's sitting in jail, uh, wrongly arrested, in my view, an American citizen. Uh, that would be a nice thing to, to do on your way out. And even something as small as that, uh, he did not achieve. And I, I just think it, it underscores that the strategy uh, was not successful. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, and now we're going to have a Biden presidency and um, the world has very much changed in the last several years. And uh, his administration is going to have to, as you mentioned in your article, recalibrate policies and implement internal reforms of these Western institutions that we have uh, been practicing uh, since, um, since World War II. So given the fact that um, the world has changed and that um, 
these institutions haven't had as much attention paid to them in the last several years. Um, what exactly will the Biden administration have to do to reimpose uh, American leadership in the world or liberal democracy in the world? And is this even feasible? Because if we look at the US population today, uh, things such as trade agreements abroad or military interventionism abroad or just too much spending internationally are very unpopular given the, the, the domestic climate. And there's more of a, of a need to focus inwards as has been the trend in the last several years. So how are we going to be able to, to, to recapture you know, U.S. leadership through these institutions during a Biden administration? Well, I think it will be challenging uh, in part because of the domestic factors here in the United States that you mentioned. Uh, but also in part because, uh, you know, uh, countries around the world got nervous during the Trump era about American leadership and the idea that we're just going to show up again, you know, President Biden and, and take our seat at the front of the table. Uh, that's not going to be that's going to be a more complex negotiation because especially in Europe, I think uh, leaders will be wondering, well, are we going to be back to a Trump era in four years time? Um, that said, I, you know, I used to work with uh, Vice President Biden. Uh, I traveled in Europe with him a few times. Um, I know his views pretty well. I know his team extremely well. All, everybody who's been named are people that I've worked with, some of them for decades. And, and there's no doubt in my mind that they uh, collectively and the president individually, president-elect uh, uh, Biden individually, believe that it's in America's interests to uh, build alliances, to cooperate, to, to, to participate in multilateral institutions because that's good for the United States of America. Not because it's some benign, benevolent thing we're doing for other people, but that it actually achieves our objectives uh, of, of security and prosperity uh, in a better way than the go it alone strategy that, that President Trump has, has trumpeted. Now, I think, the, and I, by the way, I agree with them. I think analytically they're right about that. Um, and that the liberal international order or whatever, you know, different people call it different things that were set up decades ago, we're, we as a country are better off being in that system and, and seeking to strengthen it than to be outside of it. Uh, but to, uh, to do that requires two things. One, I think, is reform and change, uh, and not just going back to the status quo ante, um, uh, including in NATO, including in, in the World Trade Organization. You know, if I think of two that need uh, reinvigoration, I, those are two I would uh, say. And then second, they've got to do a much better job, in my view, of explaining why it's in America's interest to participate uh, in these kind of multilateral organizations to the American people. Uh, I don't think, you know, in retrospect, I think the end of the Obama era, uh, we didn't do enough of that. When I, you know, we, we should have spent more time explaining our policy to the people of Montana, that's where I'm from, uh, than to explaining it to the people of Brussels. Um, you know, TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, for instance, this became this like pejorative word in American politics. Uh, but I don't, I think, you know, the vast majority of the American people have no idea what was in that trade agreement. Um, and we shouldn't even have called it a trade agreement, maybe, you know, we should have called it a enhancing environmental protection agreement, enhancing intellectual property rights agreement. But we didn't do that work to explain what was in there. And I think that that has weakened us. So I hope that, that the, the Biden administration will understand that they have to engage in leadership again externally, but also explain why they're seeking that leadership here to the American people. I absolutely agree. The narrative is vital. I mean, if you don't explain something to the population, if you don't have the right uh, means and forms of communicating important foreign policy moves to them, there's no way that they're going to understand and they're more likely to believe uh, a false piece of information or, or, a, or a conspiracy theory or just um, sensational arguments against such policies and which will 
which tend to uh, spread much faster on social media than, uh, than any real piece of, of news. So that's definitely very important. And so what about our geostrategic competition with China today? You've written about that also. Would you say that we're actually returning to a more bipolar structure? Are we even on par or are they or the Chinese even on par with the United States economically and militarily, socially, politically? It seems that there's still a bit of a lag between the, those two powers and that perhaps assuming a bipolar structure right now is a bit premature. But uh, if it is the case that we have to have this geostrategic competition with uh, this rising power, what would be the lessons from the Cold War that we could apply towards our relationship with China? Well, big, hard question. And I think it's an ongoing one that needs to be constantly interrogated. Um, you know, I'm not an expert on China. I want to emphasize that. I'm, I'm a student of, of China. Um, I have spent the two of the last four summers in China uh, working on this book about great power competition. Uh, but I do know something about the Cold War. Um, um, and, and to me, I'm, I'm, in a, I'm in a third camp. You know, the debate in America is this is the new Cold War. And then there's a second camp that says, no, this has nothing to do with the, the old Cold War. And I'm, I'm in the camp that says, no, there's some things that are like the Cold War. There's some things that are different. Uh, there are some things from the Cold War that we did successfully and that we should repeat. And there are some things we did during the Cold War that were disastrous that we have to avoid uh, when we deal with China. Uh, so it's like a two by two matrix, right? So it's, it's complex and, and I think, yes. And I, you know, my argument always to my students here and when I talk about this uh, is yes, the US-Chinese relationship is complex, deal with it. Don't oversimplify by either saying it has nothing to do with the Cold War or that it is exactly like the Cold War. Um, I mean, to tick through your, your important list just quickly, um, you know, with respect to raw power, I would say the, the United States is still the most powerful country in the world uh, if you add up all dimension, dimensions and is still growing in power. Uh, China is also growing in power, but at a faster rate. But the two of them are growing. I think sometimes people think it's like this, like the United States is declining and China is, is, is rising. I actually think comparatively, the United States continues to grow in aggregate power, but at a slower rate than China does. Um, and then if you go through like, you know, on nuclear weapons, of course, the United States has great uh, uh, asymmetry uh, of power. Um, conventional, we're still ahead, but not as much. Uh, on, on aggregate economic power, uh, we're pretty close, but GDP per capita, you know, China's not going to catch up with America for, you know, another 50 to 80 years. And that number is very important. Uh, people like to talk about aggregate economic power. GDP per capita power suggests to me that there's a lot of drama coming in China as they try to move from middle income to high income. Not many countries ever succeed in doing that. And I'm not convinced that China will succeed in doing that. Second, on the ideological piece, uh, you know, my view is, yes, there is an ideological difference uh, that is real uh, between the communist system in China and the, the democratic system of the United States, however afraid it is right now. Uh, and that, that creates tension between the two countries. And I think to try to, to, to ignore it and dismiss it as some people uh, like to argue both in Beijing and the United States is wrong. Uh, it will continue to uh, foster uh, tension for the simple fact that President Xi will be challenged by democracy because it's, it, it's a challenge of his legitimacy and vice versa. We will be threatened by the Chinese system because it challenges our legitimacy in the world. I, I think you, you may manage it, but you, you don't pretend that it doesn't exist. Um, you know, for me, the, the lessons from the Cold War uh, on the plus and minus side, again, to oversimplify, um, but a couple of key points. One is, um, I think uh, we were best when we practice containment, but not global containment. 
Uh, that is to say that we understood that, that this was going to be a competition and that, that we had to have a long uh, view of this. I'm thinking of George Kennan in particular, what he wrote about ca uh, containment. Uh, and ultimately that proved to be true. Uh, we were at our worst where we thought every little spark of nationalism we confused with communism. And then we thought if we don't stop it there, it's going to overthrow the entire system. Uh, that's McCarthyism in the 1950s. That's the Vietnam War. That's supporting freedom fighters in Angola against the MPLA in the mid 70s. And I think those are all three lessons of things we need to avoid doing uh, you know, as we seek to contain and compete with China. Um, and then the, the other more positive lesson I would remind uh, your listeners is that while we were containing the Soviet Union, we also were engaging with them, uh, especially after the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, we, um, uh, the scare of that, we learned to implement crisis prevention, crisis mechanisms, uh, so that we wouldn't uh, fall into that again. Um, uh, we did arms control. Uh, that was important. And, 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 you know, those are things we can do again with the Chinese today. And on some big uh, global issues, uh, we cooperated, you know, on smallpox, on law of the sea treaty, nuclear nonproliferation. And I don't see any reason why we couldn't do that with China today, uh, globally, even if, you know, in other dimensions we're competing. Yeah, so applying a mixed policy of uh, containment, engagement, and cooperation is probably the best way to go, uh, so as not to create uh, uh, any global disasters. But I, I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned um, the ideological component as well. Uh, it's not always at the forefront of this uh, geostrategic competition. Not everybody acknowledges that there is also an ideological component here because the competing nation is autocratic while the United States is democratic. So any influence that either China or the US would have abroad would of course uh, um, involve that component as well, the way that they do business, the way that they approach um, government relations. But at the same time, China is not exactly trying to export uh, communism abroad or coerce nations to abide by its model of, cap of uh, socialism with the Chinese flavor. Our characteristics as they call it either. So it is quite different from the Cold War, but nevertheless still uh, geostrategically very important today. And if the United States wants to, to, um, to proceed in the best way possible to stay competitive, um, I think those strategies are, are right. And also, as you mentioned before, um, engaging abroad multilateral institutions, revamping those um, communicating what U.S. leadership means, both abroad and domestically. So perhaps augmenting strategic communications would be uh, also a good um, right. strategy there. Yeah, I would add to that um, a complex idea, and I hope I can capture it in a few words. Uh, and maybe I'll start with the United States. Um, the United States is a democracy a very fragile one, uh, including, you know, as we speak, there are challenges to it, uh, but it still is a democracy, um, number one. Number two, the United States uh, uh, tries uh, from time to time to support democratic ideas and liberal values abroad, uh, and even funds groups that, that, that their sole mission the National Endowment for Democracy, the, the National Democratic Institute, the International Republican Institute, just as some examples, Freedom House. Uh, those are NGOs that are actively seeking to support democracy abroad. That's number two. Uh, number three, the United States also engages abroad uh, and does things that have nothing to do with democracy. Um, and, and uh, you know, when we sell arms to Saudi Arabia, we are not trying to use our arms sales to advance liberal democracy inside Saudi Arabia. That's not my view. I don't think that is what we're trying to do there. Uh, we're, we're, we're achieving or seeking or doing other things. And that's complex. And that causes many people around the world to say we're, we're hypocrites. Uh, and they're right. 
uh, that we do both of those things at the same time. Most certainly when I was in the government, I faced those challenges. I, I was responsible for Central Asia, for instance. And so, you know, I would travel to Kyrgyzstan and, and in, in one meeting, we wanted to keep our air base open there. And in another meeting, we wanted to support human rights activists. Uh, and those things seemed like a contradiction. And that's right, it is a contradiction. Um, I would say the same thing about China. Uh, China is an autocracy. That's to me a fact. China uh, has certain organizations uh, that seek to um, advance its ideological uh, mission abroad. That's true. The United Front exists. They have party to party training programs with parties all over the world, right? That is true. And at the same time, uh, every economic deal that a Chinese company does abroad uh, should not be misunderstood as a instrument for exporting communism, as you said, right? So every Huawei deal in Africa is not about exporting Marxism, Leninism, in the same way that every arms deal that we do in Africa is not um, um, a tool of exporting democracy. And, and that's complicated. And I think knowing the difference is really important for policymakers, but all of those things are true all at the same time. And the final thing I would say that I think is really important as we think about China moving forward, just because China is seeking to you know, export its ideology abroad does not mean that countries are just passive uh, and just accept it no matter what. Uh, I think we make a huge mistake when we look at like a BRI project, um, you know, in a democratic country in Africa and we say, oh, this is undermining democracy in Africa when we don't give any agency to the Africans. Like, you know, maybe they're capable of trading with China uh, and preserving their democracy at the same time. Uh, I think that is that is very logical in the same way that many autocratic countries around the world are capable of trading with the United States and preserving their autocracy. Uh, by the way, including the People's Republic of China. Uh, you know, every, every American deal that's done in China doesn't mean that we're undermining the uh, autocratic regime there. So I, I think it's a very complex world where both of those things are at play at the same time. That's exactly right. And those are some terrific points. I think some of the the fear is also, uh, for example, in China's 17 plus one initiative in Central and Eastern Europe, uh, is that perhaps because of the increased collaboration and cooperation between these nations, it may influence the way some of these countries, uh, the ones that are part of the European Union, uh, would vote inside a, an EU uh, uh, passing of an right. EU law, for example, as what happened with, uh, with Greece and the uh, human rights um, statement wasn't right. ratified by the European Union. So maybe just ways like that, that China could kind of come in and influence actors or the, or the way that the African nations would vote in the UN General Assembly, for example, the bloc tends to vote in similar ways. Perhaps there would be some type of influence there. But right. uh, yeah, all important factors to consider there. But for me, those are all empirical questions. I think that's th those are exactly the kinds of questions that uh, we should be studying to see, you know, under what conditions does that kind of Chinese diplomacy achieve their objectives? Under what conditions does it not? And then I think, at least for the Biden administration, they have to get smarter about counteracting those things. So, you know, in the ideological dimension and in the information dimension that we talked about earlier, you know, China and Russia have both made huge investments, uh, CGTN and RT and, you know, the Russians with all kinds of uh, other social media platforms that they're using, um, NGOs that they fund, you know, even political parties in the case of France. Um, we've got to get smarter about our counter strategy. I, I think we've really have been asleep at the wheel for a long time. And the four years of the Trump administration, uh, we really haven't engaged on this. So I think that's a big challenge for the Biden team. Mm -hmm. and, and thanks for mentioning that, because that's exactly what I wanted to end our interview with today is some uh, questions about the information war that we're currently experiencing. So there's a lot of 
um, you know, disinformation, misinformation, fake news, as you correctly mentioned, Russia invests a lot in international news outlets, which is RT, which is available in many different countries and in many different languages. Um, then, so we've, in the Cold War, it was perhaps the US truth versus the Soviet truth in, in their information uh, warfare dynamics. But today it seems to be a bit different. It's almost as though there, there is no truth or the truth is being kind of um, questioned so much that nobody knows what to believe anymore. So what is your take on the current uh, information environment and how can we as the West become more resilient in our ongoing efforts against it? Well, you're right, it definitely is different um, in a couple of respects. One, um, you know, the Soviet Union propagated uh, much more aggressively, I would say, than the Chinese do, a completely alternative system. Um, and it was the positive system, right? Uh, you know, we, we need to remember this in the West. Uh, of course, we thought communism was evil, and I most certainly personally did. I, you know, spent a lot of time trying to overthrow communism in my youth. Um, but, but the messaging was there's an alternative, more just system. And it was an alter, you know, it was about equality. And, you know, the, the, the language was a positive message. Um, whereas the Russians in particular, you know, Putin, he's not always, uh, oftentimes is not presenting an alternative positive message. It's just a, a whataboutism, a nihilism, anti-truth uh, argument. So you're right. That's harder in some ways to compete with. Um, the Chinese, I think their, their message is much more subtle. Um, and in many ways that, that makes it harder that, you know, it's like we, we've developed, uh, look at our model. And if you're a poor country, uh, choose our model, uh, as opposed to the, the, you know, the, the liberal Washington consensus that hasn't led to your economic development. So that makes it harder. You're right. Having said that, I, I do think there are some lessons from the cold war. Uh, we need to get back to, you know, uh, supporting independent media, uh, supporting, um, you know, fast fact-based broadcasting and other content, uh, not just broadcasting, other ways of, of distributing um, information. I think the separation, for instance, between what are called surrogate media organizations like RFERL, uh, and Voice of America, that needs to be increased. It, it's become too close together uh, in the Trump era. Um, and then secondly, I think we need to be much more aggressively engaged in public diplomacy. Um, I think it's a huge mistake when Trump announced to close our consulate in Vladivostok and Ekaterinburg. Those are outlets where, and I traveled there as the ambassador to both of those places, uh, that is a way to engage directly with the Russian people, not having your message mediated through Russian television or Russian uh, newspapers. Uh, it was extremely powerful when I would show up in Vladivostok and 700 people would be in the audience uh, and they had to risk. It was risky to come talk to me. Right. I was, you know, I was kind of a, a dangerous person as a U.S. ambassador because Putin was so um uh, critical of me, uh, and yet they would come. Well, the, we got to get back into that game, and I, I think that that's a challenge. But I think it's also an opportunity, because my own sense, both looking at public opinion data, and in my travels in in Europe and Asia, I actually think there's a bigger demand for liberal democratic values than sometimes we give it credit for here in the United States, and and. I actually think if we engaged more systematically uh, in nurturing those ideas, we might be surprised at how much a global demand there still remains. Exactly, I completely agree. We should never underestimate the value of diplomacy and of just um, supporting this message that so many, uh, as you say, are actually behind. I mean, I've been to the, the Balkans on numerous occasions and they're all, just trying to be more a part of the West and wishing that the EU would really step up its efforts into um, integrating the region a little bit more. So really liberal democracy and its ideals have definitely not 
um, become less popular. It's just now there are other ideas that are, you know, competing at the same time. So we might have the right. idea, you know, that it's not uh, succeeding anymore, but I don't think that's- Well, true. yeah, I mean, uh, it's definitely an ideological struggle that's back. Uh, uh, it ended for briefly after the collapse of the, the Soviet Union. Um, and number one thing uh, before we end, the most important thing that the United States can do to support democracy abroad is to reinvigorate our democracy at home. Uh, we have no credibility abroad. And then we, even when I was ambassador, it was difficult. If we're not uh, practicing and living up to our own values and standards here at home. So to me, the first order of business is to get that right first. Not, not first, I think you, you do it in parallel, but, but it has to be done in parallel. We have to get more serious about reinvigorating our democratic institutions and values here in the United States. Exactly, because you have to set the example. If there's no good example to follow, why would people follow? Right. And I'm sure you, uh, you write about this in your new book, which I'm really excited to read. It hasn't been released yet, but would you give us just a brief idea of what uh, uh, American renewal lessons from the Cold War for competing with China and Russia today is about? Uh, it's about exactly what you, we've been talking about for the last hour. It's exactly about what we've been talking about. So how do we, you know, first of all, what is the, the actual threats from both China and, and Russia and, and learning lessons from the Cold War for how to think about those threats? Uh, and then, you know, a, a set of unilateral, bilateral, and multilateral policies uh, to renew American leadership in the world. Excellent. Well, I'm really looking forward to reading it. And uh, Dr. McFall, thank you so much for your time today. I had a great conversation and a great time discussing these issues with you. Sure. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye. And to our audience, thank you so much for tuning in to Security in the 21st Century. Stay tuned for the next episode.